Good morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. It's such a, providentially in God's, God's design and His timing, such a good place, good day to end the first chapter of 1689 as we uh, land on exactly what Vic just told us. It's the ultimate authority of Scripture, uh, sorry, the authority in religious, Christian, doctrinal life is the Scriptures themselves because you know, the underlying belief of Scripture as, as to why it's authoritative over church councils, over creeds, over statements of faith, over debates, over doctors, over tradition. The reason is because only the scripture in all of the world is God breathed. We use the language of inspired. That is only the book, in the, the, the Bible, in the whole world. This is the only thing that is uh, without error and spoken by God into its exact detail. And so that is why it is our foundation. We have, in fact, I uh, said this to the earlier service and I'll remind us again. We have a, an immense and very rare privilege. There is a small sliver of all humanity that has ever lived so far that have been able to say we possess the revealed words of God. In the Old Testament, that was only the Jews. Now, it is the church all over the world, and yet still, for the billions that have lived, how few have actually held in our grasp, and we are some of those few, the written words of God, a preservation of divine truth from heaven to us. That is, that is enormous. There is no blessing or privilege higher in all of the world than to have in our grasp the revealed truths that God has spoken from heaven. There's no greater privilege. Except, Hebrews 1 tells us, let's go to Hebrews 1, we'll see it there. I'll leave you in suspense. <clears throat> this is how the book of Hebrews starts out, and this is, this is the series we're in. We're in chapter 1 still. Hebrews starts out this way, exactly as we just have. It is an amazing blessing and privilege that God in His power and His grace has revealed true things about Himself to us across the ages through prophets. Wow! Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Is there anything more glorious than that? Is there anything that is a higher privilege and blessing than hearing God's words through chosen spokespeople? The answer, no, until Jesus comes and then you realize the answer is, yes, there is actually one more thing even better, and that is God himself arriving. The prophets pointed to God. Jesus was the arrival of God. The prophets spoke truly and accurately about God who spoke through them. They spoke for God. Jesus didn't speak for God. He spoke as God. He was God. And so the verse 2 goes on to say, but he's not setting Jesus against the Old Testament. They had prophets. Oh, it's good to have somebody who speaks truly now. No, not what he's saying. Oh, they had the prophets who were liars, but now we have Jesus and he's good deal. No, he's saying God did speak truly through prophets. Wow. Yet for all of their glory and majesty and the truth of their message, you know what they weren't? The prophets weren't God. And we don't blame them for not being God. It's simply a matter of physics and nature and ontological presence. They're not God. You know what Jesus is? He's not just the best, better, majestic prophet. He's not just the message of all the prophets. He is the God who spoke through the prophets. And so Hebrews says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed as heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior even to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Now what's the answer? None. There's no angels God ever spoke that to. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. No angel heard that word. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Now being a flame of fire is pretty cool. It's pretty impressive. I'll tell you what it doesn't compare to. 
the next line. But of his son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And, another quotation, the Lord, uh, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years have no end. And here's his seven quotation from the Old Testament. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. May God bless this word in our midst this morning. The Old Testament, for all of its glory, for all of its accuracy, and for all of its God-breathed truthfulness, it remained unfulfilled, unfinished, and incomplete until its main center and message, Jesus, arrived. The entire Old Testament was reaching out to, pointing to, uh, 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 reaching towards the Messiah. Everything about the Old Testament was anticipatory in nature so that it was, it was hanging like an unfinished sentence in the air until Jesus came to complete and fulfill and finalize everything it was talking about. So that, uh, that really is the argument of the entire book of Hebrews. We remember the context that there are Christians in that early century who, because of the Roman persecution, are tempted, are so tempted to just turn back around, look at the synagogue and the glorious golden temple and say, the Jews have religious freedoms which the Christians do not. To worship Jesus can get you persecuted by the Romans, but to belong to Judaism, you have have an emperor-signed contract of religious freedom. So, I'll worship Jesus in my heart. I'll shrink back. I'll hide beneath. I'll run away and be behind the Jewish nation and their worship. And I'll worship Jesus in my heart. And the writer of the Hebrews calls that shrinking back. Don't shrink back. Go with Jesus outside of the city. Go with Jesus into persecution. Just never, ever leave behind Jesus. Here's what his argument is not. The writer of the Hebrews does not say, Don't go to the Old Testament, instead go to Jesus. He says, go to the Old Testament, and the Old Testament will point you to Jesus. It's not as if there's two alternative destinations. Oh, you could be an Old Testament believer, and you'll look Jewish, and you'll have the temple worship and the sacrificial system. Or you could be a Jesus worshiper and believe that he's the Son of God and Savior. No. The writer of the Hebrews says... If you go back to the Old Testament system and and you press ground level, you know where it spits you out? In the church of Jesus Christ. It's the Old Testament prophets, Moses, the law, the Psalms. It's that which which did make the early believers in Christ Christians. It was that scripture which pointed them to and preached the gospel for them by the apostolic witness. So the writer of the Hebrews says, Jesus is so much more glorious. He is so much more amazing than all the Old Testament prophets said. Here's reason number one. Because he is God. He's not a messenger from God only. He's not a person that tells us about God only. He is actually the fullness and trueness of God come into our flesh, our history, our world for our salvation. We're going to next week, uh, basically the rest of chapter one, He's a very Jewish-specific argument, which we need to do some background work on, and we'll do that next week. And the argument is how Jesus is better than angels. I've never really met many Gentile Christians who would put their hand up and go, I was always wondering, angels were high up on my list. Uh, So so we're going to argue that and see the argument in the book of Hebrews next week. But the basis of it is this, the reason he's better at speaking for God than all the prophets, the reason that he is the one we should worship despite the persecution, the reason Jesus is better than everything including angels is because Jesus is God entirely and without qualification. Jesus is absolutely God. So let me explain where we're going in the the structure of the sermon. Verse 2 tells us how he is God in his person. Verse 3 will tell us how Jesus is God in his nature, his very existence and being. 
And then verse 5 through to 13, we're going to take six of the seven, because one of the verses is about, is about angels. We're going to take the six quotations that the writer of the Hebrews uses from the Old Testament to prove the fact that Jesus is God. God the Son is very, very God. So let's look at, uh, first of all, the fact that he is God in his person. Look at verse 2. The, the distinction here is between prophets who spoke truly of God and the son who by his title and his status is God himself. So look at what he says. He says, yes, the prophet spoke for God and that is glorious. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. This is son without qualification, without derivation. This is God the Son who should be taken in this uh, way to represent God's trueness fully and wholly. Uh, while the prophets spoke truly of God, we could sort of see it as a, um, a kind of a, a modern day example or imagery might be this. Uh, uh, in our modern day, because of wonderful technology and all sorts of innovations, you can have relationships with face-to-face -face, uh, communications over oceans. You can be a very good friend and know the voice of and see the face of friends or people that you've never met in the flesh over oceans and over seas and over large distances because of these uh, uh, telecommunication services and devices. And that's good. And there are certain ways that unless they're, they're using a filter, some kind of pretty makeup filter or some kind of non-balding filter or whatever it is that they, unless they're using a filter, you would not look at your screen and say that this is a dishonest or inaccurate representation of who you really are. Unless they're using some kind of voice filter, you should not, we do not take that uh, uh, video high definition uh, uh, feed, we do, not, we do not say that that's a lie about them or it's inaccurate of them. It's wonderful grace to be able to speak to them in that way. And yet, if they got on a plane, arrived in your city, hopped off that tarmac and walked to you, the feeling of a shaken hand, of a warm embrace, seeing them face to face is always a world above any kind of telecommunication system. There's something about, you know, there's things that just can't be given over video, like, like, a, like a smell, and hopefully that's a good smell. You know, the, the warmth of their embrace, the, 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 uh, the voice that sounds different in person than over uh, uh, telecommunications. The, they might be a bit taller than you thought they were on screen, or a bit shorter, or a bit wider, or a bit balder, whatever it is. You look at them and get, this is more real. And this is the distinction between a screen like a prophet or a prophet like a computer screen bringing truth of God to us, the comparison of the son is that the writer of the Hebrews is saying God himself, his own son, is now the one speaking. To be given the title of son is to, the, is to claim equality. He's not just a witness to God, he is God. And this language of equality is then picked up, secondly, in, uh, in verse 2, where he says he is the heir. Whom he, that is God, appointed the heir of all things. That means that Jesus is the inheritor, not just of a land strip somewhere, not just of a castle or a throne or, or, or a large uh, a bank vault full of gold. Jesus is the inheritor of the entire cosmic realm. Everything created, all things that have existence are given to him by an inheritance from God. This is using language common uh, in their day, a little bit less today because of our sort of ways of doing inheritances, but the son is somebody who, once the father dies, is seen equal to the very authority and personhood of that father. That's why everything the father has is bequeathed to the son because the son is the true representation of and the right equal to his father. Now, this is not saying that the father will one day pass away and, and Jesus will become... What it's saying is that Jesus is rightly spoken of as son in the status of an inheritor of everything God has, therefore equal to the Father. In value, in power, in glory, in his nature, and here in his person, he is equal to the Father. Colossians 1 says that all things were created through him and for him. He inherits them. Why? As Hebrews goes on to say, he's appointed heir of all things, through whom also God created the world. That's the same point as Colossians 1. The reason all things are for him, the reason God made everything was for Jesus, 
but it's for him because he helped his father make the whole world. He is the agent through which, as we see Genesis, uh, God's design is spoken and created through the powerful word of God, John 1 tells us. Jesus is that eternal person who was the creative power, the word of God, uh, making literally everything, therefore inheriting everything because he has as his status the sonship. He is in his person a son compared to merely a speaker about God, his Status here is shown to us to be elevated to the very person of God. Now, sonship in Hebrew scripture uh, in the Old Testament is, uh, it's got a bit of a spectrum and it's not always literal. In fact, it's never literal. God would speak of the angels sometimes as sons. That's Daniel 4, Job chapter 1. Sons of God. Well, in what sense are they sons? Well, he's glorious, they're glorious. He's in heaven, they live in heaven. They're, kind of, you know, they're, li- they're more like him than we are, it would seem. So they're his sons doing his work. That's one sense. Another sense that the scripture uses son is to speak of Israel, the nation. Because God had uh, taken Abraham and made out of him and his barren wife, Sarah, a family, and they grew to become a whole nation that God was preserving and multiplying for his own sakes in the world. He had chosen them and even created them out of thin air, basically, for his own glory and his purposes. So he says in Exodus chapter 4, as well as Hosea chapter 11 and Deuteronomy 1, God calls Israel his son. Well, because he's inheriting God's blessings, etc. That's true. There's another sense in which God uses the language of son, and that was to talk about King David from the Old Testament and all of King David's descendants who would rule on the thrones. They were sons of God. So was that a claim of divinity like Rome had, the Roman? You you become Caesar, you are now Augustus, you are now God in flesh. No, their their idea was this. God's the king, you're you're a mini king. God rules righteously. Your job is to be like the Father in heaven and rule righteously. Uh, God protects his people Israel. Your job is to protect the people Israel under God. You're like a son to God. And we'll see more of that later on in chapter 1 of Hebrews. So these languages of sonship was used over um, created beings in the Old Testament at some times. But they always saw that it was a lesser degree and it was a status, hear this, It was a status, not the actual person's nature. David was called a son of God in a status, but we know it's not really that he's a son of God, not by nature. Uh, The angels were sons of God in that status. They're not really birthed or born out of God. Sorry, uh, Mormons, uh, your angel moron or moroni, whatever his name was, was wrong. We call it Jesus came, and he does not just have son as some kind of status applied to him, He is called son by very nature. He is son in his person and in his eternal person, the true son of the only father. This sets Christianity far above and apart and beyond every other religion, every other uh, uh, philosophy and, and, and religious mindset or group or cult or movement, you can go and visit uh, either their, their main prophet's grave somewhere in the desert, go on a pilgrimage, go and learn where his bones are rotting away, how glorious. Uh, other people, oh, our grand teacher, he was, he was uh, 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 transmigrated of soul and his old body is over here and you can go and go on a, a pilgrimage and visit him there where the monkeys are urinating all over the, the grave or you can climb up into the mountains. I've done this in South Asia. Climb up into the mountains on these stairs and you get into the wonderful temple of the gods who are covered in monkey defecation. How fitting. You almost want to join the monkeys Our religion is nothing like this menial, pathetic, human-level claim. We don't claim that Jesus was a tremendous rabbi with a brand new interpretation of Scripture who worked miracles and should be remembered in his life and his death. Let us go visit his grave. Not the claim of Christianity. The standalone, unbelievable claim of Christianity to which no other religion even has the gall or arrogance to try and claim is that the human who spoke to us died and came back to life is nothing other than the speaker and creator of the entire world. He owns it all. He created it all. It's coming back to him in the end days. He is literally God. That is an unmatched claim, and it is reality. 
So Jesus is shown here in verse 2 as in his very person of son to the Father, he is truly God. But he goes on in verse 3, the writer also attributes to Jesus, the son, certain parts of his nature that can only be said of God himself. And this is where now and on to the rest of the chapter, which we're going to preach this morning, you start getting a bit of a confusing distinction. There's only one God, and God is saying that Jesus is God. Is that not two gods? No. There's only one God, and this God appoints or speaks to or claims that the other person is God. We do not believe in multiple gods, two gods, or three gods. We believe in one God in nature, one God in being, one God in his existence and attributes. But within and about that one God is three persons who all have the exact same nature. That is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what we see coming through the next uh, uh, the chapter is there's only one God, and Jesus is one of the persons in that God. It is mind-blowing. You end this sermon, and if you come up to me and say, I didn't quite understand all of it, I'm going to say, me too. I'm just saying what it says, and I'm not even done studying. I don't even, I don't think we've scratched the surface, because this is the greatest mystery revealed to mankind, the incarnation of the second person of the Son. But verse 3, the writer of the Hebrews says about Jesus things that you can only rightly say about God. He says this, first of all, he is the radiance of the glory of God. The radiance. The radiance of the glory in the Old Testament was external manifestations of God's perfections, holiness, and uh, 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 power. So we see usually there are kind of, radiance is a good word because they're kind of light-focused images in the Old Testament. It was a, 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 a fiery bush talking to Moses. It was a stormy thunder, lightning, angel cloud with trumpets on Mount Sinai. It was a pillar of fire in the wilderness that, that went into the tabernacle. Uh, it was a blinding glory in some of the visions of the prophets. So the glory of God is kind of this glimpse into the absolute perfection and, and inaccessibleness of God in his very nature. If you then claim that there is a person who wholly and fully radiates the glory of God, you have either committed high-handed blasphemy or you are speaking about God. That's exactly what the writer of the Hebrews says. He says, the glory of God was shown perfectly and fully in Jesus. He is the radiance of God. Now, now all of those glories external manifestations in the Old Testament, all the fire, all the storms, a pillar from heaven of fire, those are glimpses into tiny little specks of the glory of God. They are not the radiance of God. The similarity would be if a physics teacher in high school was, you know, darkened out the room and was teaching on the sun and its light rays and its life-giving properties and how it travels through space and different mediums and wavelengths, etc., and used a, even a large or a small LED light to sort of show the class, you know, when the light hits your eyes, it's kind of painful, a, a look at how it travels and uses different angles of attack and deflection and all of this stuff, eh, to, and then say, this is like the sun. That display, though everything he says is true, to call that light like the sun is an extreme derivative sense. The comparison of that and then getting a huge NASA-scale telescope, uh, pointing it directly at the sun at midday, bringing the high school students over and taping their face to it to look up at the sun, that would get him fired and likely the children a hole in the back of their skull. This is an accurate yet incomplete picture of the light of the sun. And basically the book of Hebrews is showing us the prophets spoke of God's glory in accurate ways and in marvelous miracles that had nowhere near the radiant effulgence and powerful glory that Jesus showed us of God. He is the actual light rays coming off of the actual sun. It can give you life. It can give you cancer. It can burn you to pieces. It can sustain your biological nature. That's the power of the light coming from the sun. Some of your versions might say uh, effulgence in this word of uh, of the radiance of God's glory. He is the shining forth absolutely of God's glory, not because he had a halo, not because fire followed him around in his earthly life, but because he was by nature God in essence. 
So here's the radiance of his glory. Not demigod, not semi-god, not derivative. He is the fullness of God's glory. And then he says, and the exact imprint of his nature. This imagery now is not sun and light rays. Now he's using the, 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 the imagery of a stamp and the mark left behind by the stamp, an imprint. As a stamp is pressed upon maybe clay in the old, uh, olden days or maybe a wax seal on a letter, as that stamp is placed upon the, uh, the, the, uh, the whatever soft surface that is going to soon harden, the picture left behind is an exact imprint of the stamp or it is not an imprint at all. It can, be a, it can go wrong, it can be broken, it can, if it's inaccurate, then the stamp is not the real thing. His claim here is that if you study the nature, the essence, the being of God the Son, you will find the exact same essence, nature, being, and attributes as studying the Father. There is no distinction. There is no distinction between the being of Jesus, God the Son, and the being of God the Father. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, teachers like to use Venn diagrams. Right? You show similarities by here's one circle and that's, uh, that's God the Father. Here's another, another circle and that's God the Son. And look at the overlaps between them. And we'll write the, the, the overlapping principles in, in the wedge space there. Theologians explain that if we were to have a circle for God the Son's nature and a circle for God the Father's nature and put them on a Venn diagram, they would exactly and perfectly overlap with no distinction. It's called perichoresis. They both entirely, along with the Spirit, entirely exhaust one another's attributes. There is no more divinity in the Father than there is in the Son. Jesus, God the Son, is entirely, holy, fully, the exact imprint. He shares the nature of the Father. This would be the most blasphemous thing a Jew could say who on one hand will chant, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And then say that there is a person who wholly and entirely exhausts the nature of that God and yet is distinct in person. This is the glorious nature of the Trinity. Now then, in kind of borrowing from a philosophical Greek uh, and maybe a little bit of the, the, the Jew, the uh, uh, Philo, the Jewish, his sort of uh, philosophy, they had this, and some of you who are familiar with classical Greek and Roman philosophy, you'll be, you'll, you'll be familiar with the language of uh, the greatest being, greater than whom cannot be conceived, or the prime mover, the first mover who is himself unmoved. The, the, the being that the philosophers tried to argue for from very nature and logic and reason, they said there must be something, some being outside of time, beyond nature, outside of creation, glorious, wise, perfect, the first and greatest being who gave rise to all other existence, the ground of all being, who upholds everything by his logos, by his word, by his own power. And that's the language that the writer of the Hebrews now uses of God the Son. His claim is that Jesus, God the Son, is the ground of all life, all being, and all existence by saying that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The universe has existence by the say-so of the crucified Son of God. He is carrying it along to its intended purpose, and it is all in the palm of his hand. That's God the Son. So this is the twofold way in which Jesus truly is God. In verse 2, his person as son and also his nature. The writer just attributed to him things that you can only say about God, but he says it about Jesus. Jesus is God the Son and God the Son is God in nature. And then he uses six Old Testament quotations to show that Jesus is not just another angel, the greatest and first created beings. He is the creator of all created beings. He is God entirely and holy. Because he would, we remind ourselves, the early first century Jewish temptation. Or really all, all Christians in the early centuries, their temptation was this. We have persecution from the Romans. We have persecution from the Jews. The Jews are Old Testament. Uh, well, the Romans just hate us. Obviously, since the Jews are persecuting us and kicking us out, and they claim the Old Testament, obviously now the Christian thing to do is leave behind and burn away the Old Testament because we have Jesus, God's Son now. 
And Paul's argument is this is inaccurate. This is horribly erroneous. This is wrong. As deep as you can write those letters into your eyeballs, right? that's wrong. Jesus is the message of God. Yes, Jesus is the message of God from the Old Testament. So, so he says uh, the, 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 Jesus is greater than the prophets because he's God. He's greater than the angels because he's God. You know how we know that? The angels and the prophets told us so in the Old Testament. What a wonderful unity he sees in all of Scripture with no contradictions between old and new. So he goes to the Old Testament to prove the divinity of God's Son. Look at uh, chapter, uh, uh, look at verse 5 here in Hebrews chapter 1. You know, 6, I want to say rapid fire. You can be the judge of how rapid fire this is. Six rapid fire explanations of these verses that he uses to, descri- to argue for the divinity of the Son. First, he quotes, if you're a note taker, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. This is one of the ones that we referred to, to before. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, this is, quoting, this is a, 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 a prophecy that was about David's sons, the kings. We, we sort of mentioned this before. This was, uh, David was writing what God was telling him. Uh, I tell you of this degree, decree, today I have begotten you. You are my son. And so the writer, the, the, the writer and sort of the Jewish interpretation was, the kings are going to be the sons of God. But by the time Jesus came, their interpretation had, I think, rightly um, it developed so that they saw that as being a promise of a future king who would rule in the authority of God the Father. Now, uh, that was a correct way to read it. The problem that the Jews had was that they just didn't attribute that Messiah to Jesus Christ. They had another problem, though, is that they thought that you are my son today, I have begotten you. They thought all that uh, uh, um, uh, referred to was the coronation of the king. The coronation is when he steps into his robe, gets the throne, gets the crown, sits down and rules with the scepter. They thought, and in, in some measure they were right, they thought that God begetting sonship into this king happened on the coronation. Right? He's human, he's righteous, whatever he is, but he is also a sinner. But when he steps into that role as king, it is as if God begets him as his own son. Now, beget is not usually a word that we utilize. It warrants some explanation. Begetting is basically the fatherly form of the female birthing. Right? Now, begetting is much easier than birthing. We understand. Don't make that the argument. But what a woman does for a child is conceive is grow and then give birth to. That's her contribution to the child. That's about 99.99% of it, let's be honest. The father's contribution to a child is what we call begetting. That is that a a cell leaves him and goes into the... But the child doesn't leave him. He at no point carries, holds, or touches the child until it is born nine months later. The father has the role of giving to that future child his likeness, his imagery, his DNA. That's what he does. The mother does the receiving, the the carrying, and then the birthing. So when God speaks to kings and says, on your coronation day, I'm begetting you, it is as if he is saying you are being elevated up into a status of son of God, but not really son of God. Son of God by status. Son of God by badge. Son of God by sash, and title only. What they did not understand, what the Hebrew writer now argues, is that what Psalm 2-7 was looking forward to was not just somebody human by nature who would receive a status of the Son of God, but somebody who is God by nature receiving the kingship as status. He was God himself. It is Son, it is God the Son who became king, and this is shown again to us in 2 Samuel chapter 7, which he then quotes at the end of verse 5. So he says, or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The logic goes like this. The king, if we take the Old Testament and we think hard about it, the king must be God. Jesus is the king. Therefore, Jesus is God. So so he argues that with his uh, next quotation from 2 Samuel 7. He says, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son, which which the uh, 
the Jews heard that God would, had promised that to David, that his, his son would rise up and be a righteous king. He would rule justly and have this extended, expanded, and eventually eternal kingdom. And they go, wow, right, it's not David, it's his son. Then Solomon takes the throne. They go, wow, he's a good fighter. He's a good man. He's a great king. He's a great husband to a thousand wives and a good servant to all of the pagan gods. Ah, it's not him. It obviously isn't him. He's an idolater and an adulterer. He's failed. It's not him. His son. Yes, that son maybe this prophecy is about. And then he rises to power and splits the kingdom in two. And it never unifies. So now the Jews are begging the question. God doesn't lie. And God promised that one of David's sons would build an eternal kingdom. This eternal kingdom has to be future. We haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen the, con- the king yet. We haven't seen the kingdom come arrive. So it must be future. Here, though, is where their logic stopped short. Why did all of the previous kings fail to truly be the son of God? Because they were sinful humans. Now, you're gonna, if what you're waiting for is a king to arrive who can be a perfect son of God, you'll be waiting, as the Jews still are, for millennia upon millennia because that Messiah can never arrive. A human who is unsinful And not himself God doesn't exist. The writer of the Hebrews is saying this. When God told to us that a human son of David would eventually rule and reign in perfection and God would relate to him as son without qualification, then he was telling us in a veiled way there would be a king who comes who is not merely human, who is not sinful. Therefore, He's sort of stepping back into the shoes of 2 Samuel and the Davidic covenant promise. And he says, when God promised there would be a king who would come, who would be perfect, he was promising us that that king would be God. For no one is perfect but God. So again, the argument is this. The king must be God. Jesus is that king. Jesus is God. He goes to his third line of uh, arguing. Look down in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 8, of the Son, God says, your throne, O God. Now, this is quoting Psalm 45. This is a very, uh, uh, oh, sorry, we've we've missed one, didn't we? You're allowed to put your hand up and say I skipped over Scripture uh, when I do that. Verse 6, look at verse 6, first of all. That's a quotation from Psalm 97, verse 7. It's also a quotation from the same phrase in Deuteronomy 32. Verse 6, it says, When he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So in Psalm 97, God's rebuking idolatry, and God is saying, all of you gods who are worshipped, now, we're good Christians, we know what false gods really are, who are worshipped in paganism and New Ageism, etc. It is demons veiled to give power to human beings and inspire another religion to de-glorify God. So when God speaks to false gods, he's actually speaking to demons. Maybe that extends also to unfallen angels. We're not entirely sure, but here's the command of Psalm 97. To all of the demons that are worshipped, and to all of the angels that see this, worship the firstborn son. In Deuteronomy 32, the language is, all of those people who worship false gods will be finally judged on the day that God wraps up history and brings his judgment down. So worship God, everybody. And the writer of the Hebrews says that those verses are actually about God the Son, who we know as Jesus Christ. He says, uh, God commands demons angels, all human beings, to worship him. To worship who? Hebrews 1.6 tells us he's talking about God the Son. Now, God is not a breaker of any of his commandments. That goes without saying, but follow the logic. God in one place says, worship no one else but me. Second commandment, don't worship me through any other people or images. He also says in Isaiah 45, Is there any other God beside me? I know not one. My glory I give to no other. There is no other God beside me. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. He said that on this half. He doesn't give glory. He doesn't allow worship to anybody but God. And then he commands all demons, angels, and people, worship this other person. 
You cannot undo that Gordian knot without simply confessing there is another person who is rightly defined and named God. That is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. He goes on, after commanding angels to worship him, therefore he must be God. Uh, Verse 8, of the Son he says, and here he quotes Psalm 45. Psalm 45 is... You think it's just a wonderfully sublime, heavenly poem about the king of Israel. But then it has this cryptic phrase that the Jews didn't really know what to do with. And that is it starts talking to the enthroned one as God, which, okay, maybe he just changed subject and was talking about the human God and then went up towards worship to God. But then he says that the one on the throne, who is God, has been appointed and anointed by God. That's one of those, those passages that in Shabbat school, you just sort of fold it over and you, you, you shush the kids up who want to ask questions about it. We move on to the next passage. They did not know how to explain this. Psalm 45 says this, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, well, God doesn't have a God, does he? There's God and then there's no one else. How is he saying that God is on the throne and God has put him there? God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. It really is as simple as this. In God, there are three eternal, co-equal, divinely, eternally existing persons. God, and it's just that simple. I'm sure you're all, you're all about to say exactly that and you'd say it in a heartbeat. That's, that, that's all it is. In the one eternal being of God, there is distinct persons. And Jesus, who is the Messiah to come, has been anointed, who is the God forever, and it is his and his throne is the throne being sung about in Psalm 45. The only differences between the Father and the Son is a distinction of personal relation. No nature, no essence, no attribute is different between the two. You could say it this way in a very human sense. If you took a blood test to the Father and a blood test to the Son, you find the exact same thing. There is no substantial or essential, I'm leaning on old Greek phrases here, there is no difference in the actual being or nature. The only distinction between them is that one refers to the other and relates to the other as Son, being a Father, and the other one relates to the Father as the Son. The only distinction. It's an eternal distinction, but it is the only distinction. So it's full and completely right that we worship Jesus as full God. Psalm 102 is there where is the next part that he quotes, and that's in verse 10. Look at verse 10 in Hebrews chapter 1. He quotes Psalm 102 as saying this, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. The writer of the Hebrews is saying, of the Son, back in verse 8 he says this, of the Son he says, verse 10, Psalm 102. Psalm 102 is therefore about Jesus Christ. It is about God the Son. He, Jesus, laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of Jesus' hands. They will perish, but Jesus remains. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, Jesus will roll them up. He's the judge and the recreator of the entire world. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you, Jesus, are the same, and your years will have no end. That's the right way to read Psalm 102. In fact, we could go back through the rest of the psalm and find other claims or other phrases about God and impute them to Jesus, as the writer of the Hebrews is telling us to do. We could say this, that in verse 12, where it says, You, O Lord, are enthroned forever, we must confess. You, O Jesus, are enthroned forever. Well, verse 15 says, nations will fear the name of the Lord. We confess, nations will fear the name of Jesus. Where it says, all the kings of the earth will fear your glory, God. We say, all the kings of the earth will fear Jesus' glory. So Jesus, according to this psalm quotation in verse 10, is the creator of the entire world, is the judge of the entire world, is the one who will recreate the entire world, yet is in himself immutable and unchangeable because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Psalm 102 tells us. And he has no end. He is eternal. 
to say any of these things about anybody other than someone who is truly God is blasphemy. And you need to rip up your Bible, put it aside, find a more consistent religion. Because Christianity doesn't make sense unless Jesus is God. Now, our last quotation is here in, in verse 13. And this, this is taken from Psalm 110 verse 1. And it's, it's often said, and I like it, that Psalm 110 verse 1 is God's favorite Bible verse. The reason they say that is because Psalm 110 verse 1 is the verse from the Old Testament most cited and referred to in the New Testament. It's heavily leaned upon. It is heavily used to explain and argue for the reality of Jesus' lordship, his enthronement, his Messiah status, and his divinity. And that is what the writer of the Hebrews does here. He uses this not only to prove that Jesus is above the angels, but to prove that Jesus is God and therefore above the angels. Verse 13. To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand? The, the angels see God's right hand. They cover their faces with a pair of their wings so that they don't look upon the unmitigated glory of God's right side. They, they fly above the earth, above the, the, the ground in heaven, so that they don't even touch the same ground as the throne of God's right hand. No angel could ever conceive of, of being invited to sit upon the throne of God. No being would ever be invited by God to come and take it. That's what God is saying. The Father is saying in Psalm 110 verse 1, please take my throne. My crown is for you. Use my scepter. It is right that you should reign and then let me serve you. Let me gather your enemies, Psalm 110 verse 1 says. I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet. I will go throughout the world. I will control history. I will topple your enemies in such a way that a many large number of them are converted to serve you and, and be saved by you. They bend their knee willingly in their heart. But your enemies will also be crushed. They will bend their knees. Their tongues will confess that you are Lord, but your feet will be upon their throats and your foot will be upon them like a footstool. That's what the Father says to this other person that he's talking to in Psalm 110 verse 1, it would be sheer blasphemy from the mouth of God himself if that person he was giving the throne to was not by nature God. Distinct in person, but entirely equal in nature is the God who takes the throne, whose name the New Testament tells us is Jesus Christ, and whose name is the only name given by God under heaven by which we must be saved. This is where we're going to close out. Look at verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 3 says, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, the second sentence. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down at the throne of God as Psalm 110 verse 1 said. And verse 3 of Hebrews 1 tells us that's because he earned that place. He is right. It is good. He is qualified and anointed and appointed to rule over God's kingdom, to be the God enthroned forever, to be the son who God is a father to, to be the son of David and David's Lord. It is right that he is the king because he first humbly came and obeyed his father and gave out of love his own life into death on the cross and thereby made purification of sins. This is why there is such a thing as the gospel as good news for sinners like you and I, who have sinned against this God, the Son, who have sinned against His law, who have broken His royal commands. We are beneath the righteous scepter and holy judgment of God, the Son, and He will judge every soul on the last day. But that same God, the Son, came to the earth and made purification for sins that was acceptable to God on the cross. Imagine, if you will, and we can't, but imagine, if you will, the power, the essential, vital power 
The sin-cleansing, wonder-working power that must be in the blood of one who is not just a man, good man, religious leader, dying on the cross as an example, but God, very God in the flesh, God the Son, Jesus Christ. When he makes an offering for sin, when he gives his soul up to guilt, when he gives his body and his life over to suffer the condemnation and penalty that we deserve. When this God, when this Messiah makes a purification for sins, how potent and powerful its cleansing atonement must be. That's why there's good news for you and me. We are horrible sinners and Jesus, the God-man's blood, can and will cleanse you. And all you need to do is call on Jesus in this very way that he has presented this morning. You get none of his salvation if you deny his Godship. You get none of his mercy if you blaspheme him and say he is an angel, a first created being, a little lesser than God, but still very glorious. There's no salvation on those terms. But receive Jesus by faith in your heart that he is true God, become true man and died for you, risen again to glorious life and is now enthroned forever. You have all of God's mercy in the moment you believe. Let's pray. God, it is impossible to walk away from a passage of Scripture like this and feel like we've, we've given it everything it deserves or feel like we fully understand it or feel like I, as a preacher, have given it its, its right worth and glory. Father, of course we have not. You've spoken such glorious, manifold, majestic, infinite truths in this simple, single chapter that we can and will spend all of eternity mulling it over, worshipping you, praising you, growing in our understanding of the truths that we now confess. But you have spoken in a way we can grasp to some degree. We cannot know you fully, but we can know you truly. And we know you truly in the face and in the gospel and in the person of your Son sent for us, Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord God, that if there is any demonic questioning and doubts or uh, cultic or other religious uh, uh, blindfolds or strongholds on people's minds and souls, that you would slip them off as the clarity of Hebrews 1 tells them in their soul, Jesus is fully God. Uh, anybody who is withholding faith in Jesus, who is not trusting in him for their salvation, would you please at this moment destroy all other hopes that they seem to build up and throw their heart towards Jesus Christ? Would you, would you help them to see that Jesus being God is worthy of all of their trust and able to save them from all of their sin. Father God, would you exalt, now you have done it in the word, please now do it in our hearts, our souls, and in our song, the glorification and the exaltation of Jesus as truly God, our Savior. We pray with faith because we pray in his name. And everybody said, amen.